mata Kumikin ang kina Di ko maintindihan Ang iyong mga tingin Labis lang mga ningning Langit ay bumaba Bumaba pa pala ang tala exciting part Nakabahan ako. Wala akong maalala sa mga inaaral ko, no? Paano nga ba to? Ay, bahala na! The function of the male reproductive system as a whole includes production, storage and transfer of gametes, otherwise known as sperm, along with hormone secretion and sexual pressure. The external genitalia of a male includes mainly the scrotum and the penis, but we will start first with the perineum. The perineum in the male is an area between the thighs, shaped roughly like a diamond. It extends from the pubic symphysis anteriorly to the coccyx posteriorly. The ischial tuberosity forms the lateral boundary. At the same time, a line is drawn between the ischial tuberosities, dividing the area into a larger urogenital triangle containing the penis and the scrotum. While the other half is called the anal triangle, which contains and surrounds the anal itself. Moving on to the penis. The penis has three parts the root, the body, and the glands penis. In the root of this inferior view, we can see the bulb and the curia of the penis. Thus, the body of the penis is formed with erectile tissues or spongy tissues that become turgid and erect when filled with blood. It is the corpus trongeosum and corporal cavernosa. Corporal cavernosa forms most of the shaft of the penis surrounded by tunica albuginea. And during penile erection, contains the majority of the blood due to its rich vasculature. The corpus spongiosum is also covered by tunica albuginea and along with the crons the urethra in between both corpus spongiosum that also tapers slightly and extends into the glans penis. Lastly is the glans penis. It's a bulb-shaped tip that is positioned on the most distal part of corpus spongiosum and that is covered by the propus or the foreskin for those uncircumcised males. The scrotum is a wrinkled loose sack of skin that hangs behind the penis. Each compartment of the fibromuscular pouch, which is divided into two parts by a median septum or raft, contains a testis, an epididymis, and a portion of the spermatic cord. We will know more about this later on in the internal part. Fun fact, one known protective function of the scrotum is to act as a climate control system for the testis. The testis need to be just a little bit colder than body temperature for normal sperm development. Thus, in the wall of the scrotum, 
there are special muscles that allow it to contract and relax like moving the testicles away from the body to cool the temperature or closer to the body for warmth and protection. Now, let us discuss the internal organs. Let's begin with the testis. Testis is known to be the primary male organ. It is an oval organ in the scrotum about the size of very large olives, secured at either end by the spermatic cord and nervous muscle. A function of which is the production of sperm cells and testosterone or the male sex hormone. Thus, the testis also has lobules that are closely made up of seminiferous tubules and are separated by a fibrous interlobular sector. Each of these sectors extends from the mediastinum of the testis to the tunica albogenia or innermost layer of the external covering of the testis. Going back, the seminiferous tubules are tightly coiled tubes that are entwined with each other in the site for spermatogenesis. The walls of which actually contain germ cells, classify their sertoli cells and labid cells. Sertoli cells supports and protects immature sperm cells as they travel the length of the seminiferous tubules where they will eventually mature. While on the other hand, the labic cells produce the male hormone testosterone, which is responsible for male secondary sex characteristics. Moving on, located within the mediastinum of the testis, is another delicate tubal network known as the red testis. This red testis is a labyrinth of epithelium line channels embedded in the testis of the mediastinum. It also transports sperm from seminiferous tubules to efferent blockchains. Surrounding this network of tubules and septa is the tunica albuginea, known to have a top fibrous capsule, which we already mentioned earlier. The connected tissue framework of the testis is formed by the tunica albuginea and the interlobular septa. Superficial to the tunica albuginea is a layer known as the tunica vaginalis. This layer is a close peritoneal sac composed of two layers, an inner visceral and an outer parietal layer. The visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis lies on the external surface of the testis just superficial to the tunica albuginea. It surrounds the surface of the testis except at the attachment of the epidermis and spermatic cord. Next is the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis. It is the most external layer and much looser and extends in a superior direction, creating a cavity between the visceral and parietal layers. The fluid within the cavity of the tunica vaginalis allows the testis to move freely within the scrotum. Next is the epidermis. Attach the posterior surface of each testis outside the tunica albuginea and contained within the tunica vaginalis is the epididymis. The epididymis is a C-shaped structure or a coil of thin tubules in the shape of a crescent which consists of a series of ducts and is the site of spermatozoal maturation and storage. The epididymis is divided in three parts, the head, the body, and the tail. Continuing the next structure is the ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens. It is a long tube with a thick muscular wall and relatively half thin lumen. It is also the continuation of the tail of the epididymis that carries sperm from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct in the pelvic cavity. Spermatic cord. The spermatic cord is the tubular structure that suspends each testis in the scrotum. Moving on, a seductus deferens travels through the inguinal region and into the pelvis. It courses alongside the bladder and medial to the ureter. Thus, the final part of the ductus deferens is in the bladder and passes medially to the ureter before enlarging to form the ampulla of the ductus deferens. It then terminates by joining the duct of the seminal gland to form the ejaculatory duct. Now, we will discuss the accessory glands. To start off, the two seminal glands known as the seminal vesicles are elongated and obliquely oriented structures located between the bladder and rectum. The seminal vesicles do not store sperm, rather they secrete seminal fluid, a fructose-rich alkaline fluid that mixes with the sperm as they pass through the ejaculatory ducts. 
This fluid provides sperm with an energy source and coating agent to neutralize the acidity of the vagina and the cervical mucus. These secretions from the seminal vesicles comprise the bulks of the semen, making up 70% of the volume of ejaculate. Now, we have reached the ejaculatory duct, a 2 cm in length, formed by the fusion of the ampulla of the vas deferens and seminal vesicles at the prostate gland. After this fusion, this duct pierces and passes through the prostate and empty into the prosthetic part of the urethra. In this central view, let's clearly see its anatomy. We have the prostate gland located below the bladder, the penis, and the urethra. Zooming in, we can see the slit-like opening of the ejaculatory ducts which empty into the prosthetic part of the urethra. Then, in this sagittal view, we can see the prostate gland. A chestnut-sized gland sits at the neck of the bladder and surrounds the proximal portion of urethra. The prostate gland secretes milky fluid that aids in motility and activation of sperm. The last accessory gland is the bulbourethral gland, also known as the cowper's gland. This pea-sized structure secretes clear, watery fluid that lubricates the urethra in preparation for the passage of semen. In this sagittal view, we can see the bubble urethral glands located inferior to the prostate and posterior lateral to the intermediate part of the urethra. The bulbourethral glands empty into the posterior aspect of the urethra at this point. And lastly, for this internal organ, we have the urethra. The male urethra is a muscular tube that evacuates urine from the bladder in the passageway for male ejaculate. In this coronal section, the urethra is composed of four parts. The periprostatic urethra, the initial part of the urethra that starts just after the internal urethral orifice. Next is the prostatic urethra which passes through the prostate gland. Continuing on is the membranous urethra or the intermediate part which connects the prostatic urethra to the spongy urethra. Finally, the spongy part or also known as the penile urethra contains the corpus spongiosum erectile tissue of the penis that opens outside through the external urethral orifice. After talking about the male reproductive parts and how they work, now we finally discuss what happens when those parts come together to do what they were born to do, which is sex. What we will be discussing here is all about spermiogenesis and how is sperm mature that could lead to fertilization. When puberty comes knocking, the hypothalamus starts releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone and this tells the anterior pituitary to secrete follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone into the blood just like in females. But in females, LH or luteinizing hormone leads to the release of estrogen in the follicles, whereas in males, it spurs the Leydig cells to release testosterone. Meanwhile, the FSH triggers the sertoli cells to release androgen binding protein or ABP. This binds to the testosterone creating large local concentrations of this stuff which is ultimately what triggers the production of sperm. The target of the testosterone are the outer muscles in the tubules called spermatogonia. They are the stem cells that set the sperm making process in motion by dividing. But when puberty starts, the testosterone causes them to divide differently. Instead of splitting into two identical spermatogonia cells, they begin producing two distinct spermatogonia. One type of daughter cell known as a type A cell stays up near the basal lamina and just keeps dividing. So you never run out of spermatogonia. But the other kind, the type B, gets pushed down the tubule toward the lumen and into primary spermatocytes. These primary spermatocytes then go into meiosis 1 and form two smaller haploid cells called secondary spermatocytes. They then rush through meiosis 2 and their resulting daughter cells total four round spermatids. These spermatids now have all the 23 chromosomes they need for fertilization, but they aren't exactly mobile. If they're ever going to find themselves an egg, they need a way to get around and they need a tail. 
The process by which a spermatid elongates, grows a tail or flagellum, and officially becomes a mobile sperm is called spermogenesis. And the whole process takes about five weeks. But it's not like it holds anything up because there are plenty more where those spermatids came from. In the end, each primary spermatocyte gives rise to four actual sperm. And considering how many spermatogonia are continuously dividing into spermatocytes, it's easy to see how a mature male can crank out 1,500 sperm a second. Now, obviously, if sperm are going to get anything accomplished, they have to leave the seminiferous tubules that made them. So even once they have tails, they still need to let a little help getting going. That's why each tubule is surrounded by several layers of myoid cells, which like a smooth muscle, rhythmically contract using peristalsis to squeeze the sperm and some fluid secreted by the sertoli cells through all the twists and turns toward their next destination, the rid testis in the posterior testis. From there, the sperm, although still immobile, leave the testes by way of the epididymis, a long tangled set of tubules behind the testes, where they'll spend the next few weeks gaining their mobility. The bulk of the epididymis consists of the enormous duct of epididymis. This duct is full of tiny microvilli called stereocelvia, which provide a huge surface area to help reabsorb some extra fluid and help pass along nutrients to feed the idling sperm. It takes a sperm nearly 20 days to work their way through this labyrinth, during which time they continue to mature. Once through the duct, they enter the inferior epididymis where they gain mitochondria so they'll have energy to swim hard at a moment's notice. When the time comes during ejaculation, the sperm flow from the epididymis through the vas deferens, a tube that travels up behind the bladder and joins with a duct from the seminal gland to create the ejaculatory duct. The left and right ejaculatory ducts pass into the prostate gland where they empty into the urethra which runs from the bladder, through the penis, and into the outside world. These systems of tubes feeding into tubes allows all the necessary glands to make their contributions to a moving wave of seminal fluid that helps the sperm mature and perform their ultimate function which is fertilization. The resulting mix of sperm, testicular fluid, and gland secretions, which we call semen, provide the sperm with transportation, nutritional energy, chemical protection, and finally activates their motility. Now for the next topic, it is all about female reproductive system. So keep on watching. Now, let us discuss the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system consists of internal reproductive organs and external reproductive organs. Overall, the female reproductive system has several functions. These include the formation and development of gametes, which are otherwise known as ova, exos, or simply eggs. The production of female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, sexual pleasure, and making her production possible. Fertilization and implantation of the egg and maturation of the embryo and fetus happen within the female reproductive tract. To further familiarize you with the precise function of each organ, we will help facilitate your understanding. Let's start with the external reproductive organs. discussing the female internal reproductive system. First, we would start with the vagina. The vagina is also known as the birth canal as the baby passes from the uterus through this passage during labor. The vagina is a particularly multitasking organ that has multiple roles and these roles includes the facilitation of menstruation, childbirth, 
and sexual intercourse. It also plays a significant role in fe human female sexuality and sexual pleasure. The vagina is a fibromuscular tube, roughly 8 to 10 centimeters long across the posterior wall, and about 7.5 centimeters across the anterior wall. Now, we're zooming in on the vagina. Part of the structure superior to the vagina in this image is known as uterus. It protrudes into the vagina. And to come back to our structures and their relationships to one another, the recess that is formed between the cervix and the vaginal wall is known as the vaginal fornix. The fornix is continuous, but sometimes divided into an anterior fornix, posterior fornix, and lateral fornix. And now, let's proceed to the uterus. The uterus is also known as the womb, has several functions, the most important of which incline its role as a host for the development of the fetus during gestation. The uterus also provides vaginal and uterine secretions, and the last sperm to pass through the uterine are the fallopian tubes in order to fertilize an egg. The uterus is about 8 cm long and can be divided into three main parts, the cervix, the isthmus, and the corpus, or the body. The first part we want to take a look at is the cervix. It is considered the neck or the narrowing of the vagina, which extends from the isthmus of the uterus, which is around above here, to the external os or the external orifice, which is down here. The cervix is about 2.5 cm long and plays an important role in fertilization and childbirth. Some portion of the cervix protrudes through the vagina, and some are not. The portion that projects into the vagina is called the vaginal portion, while the portion that does not project into the vagina is called the supravaginal portion. The cervix has two orifices or openings. The internal orifice opening into the isthmus of the uterus, which is the connection between the cervix and the body of the uterus, and the external orifice opening into the vagina. The canal between these two openings is referred to as the cervical canal. The next part of the uterus is known as the isthmus. The isthmus is a narrowing of the uterus that's around about 1 cm long connecting the cervix and the corpus lithium of the uterus. The third part of the uterus is the corpus. The body has a triangular shaped lumen which is houses not only the site of fertilization but also the fetus during gestation. The fundus is an important part of the uterus and is considered as the base of the uterus. It is often measured in pregnancy to determine growth rates of the fetus. Microscopically, the uterus is known to have three layers. The endometrium, the mucosa of the uterus, the myometrium, the smooth muscle layer of the uterus, and the perimetrium, or the outer serous layer covering of the uterus. The endometrium is the innermost layer of the three layers of the uterus and also referred to as the uterine mucous membrane. The endometrium is lined with simple columnar epithelium and contains numerous tubular glands as well as lamina propria. Histologically, the endometrium is divided into two layers, a functional layer and a basal layer. And both of these layers are important to note as the functional layer is the layer of blood that is shed in the process of menstruation when the uterus does not get fertilized during a female's monthly cycle and the functional layer regenerates from the basal layer after each shedding. The myometrium is comprised of the complex of three smooth muscle layers. The first layer that we're going to talk about is the subvascular layer, which is a thin layer of smooth muscle that participates in the sealing of the uterine tubes and the separation of the endometrium during the menstrual cycle. The second layer of the myometrium is the vascular layer, which is a strong, 
layer of muscle that is well perfuse running around the uterus like a net and the vascular layer plays a major role during labor. The supravascular layer, which is our last layer on our smooth layers of the myometrium, is a thin sheet of crossing muscle fibers stabilizing the uterine wall. The myometrium is a continuation of the muscle layers of the uterine tubes and the vagina. The perimetrium It is our outer layer of the uterus and is made up of mesothelium and a thin layer of loose connective tissue and it is continuous with the peritoneum in the pelvic and abdominal cavities. In this image, which is a sagittal section of the pelvis, we can see our favorite organs. So of course, our uterus is here. Our bladder is here, our rectum is here, and our vagina stretching out down here. And of course, Note that the uterus and the vagina are located in the between the bladder and the rectum, with the body and the fundus of the uterus lying on top of the bladder. The uterus is both an antiflexion and antiversion. Antiflexion refers to the forward dipping of the uterus over the cervix. Well, now we have the axis of the cervix and the vagina or the antiversion, and we can see here that the cervix is dipping forward over the vagina. The fallopian tube or the uterine tube, or sometimes called oviduct, are important structures in the female reproductive tract providing a site for fertilization as well as providing passage for the transport of ovum or eggs from the ovaries to the body of the uterus. They're also the main connection between the uterine and peritoneal cavities. The two fallopian tubes are about 10 centimeters long and project superolaterally from the body of the uterus at the uterine horns as we can see in this image. And the fallopian tube consists of four main parts, which is the intramular part, the isthmus, ampulla, and the infundibulo. The intramular part, sometimes also called the interstitial part, this part of the fallopian tube is located within the myometrium of the uterus and is roughly about 1 cm long and 0.7 mm wide. Next, the isthmus is a lateral continuation of the intramular part and as we can see, it is a rounded muscular part of the fallopian tube and is also the narrowest part of the tube that's around 3 cm long and between 1 and 5 mm wide. The third part of the tube is referred to as the ampulla, and as we can see, it is the longest and widest part of the fallopian tube, with a diameter of 1 cm at its widest point, and the ampulla is around about 5 cm long, which is roughly over half the length of the tube, and also has a thin wall, a folded luminal surface, which is usually the site of fertilization. Last part of the fallopian tube is the infundibulum. And the infundibulum is the most distant part of the fallopian tube is funnel-shaped opening into the peritoneal cavity and the abdominal ostium. And this finger-like mucosal projection, which we can see to the distal end of the infundibulum or what we would refer as fimbrae. And of course, let us zoom in and have a closer look at this fimbrae. And this finger-like projection, of which there are roughly 25, are basically little fingers that drape over the ovary and help gather the ovum from the ovaries and into the fallopian tube. And the fimbrae are about 1 mm wide, while the longest of the fimbrae, the ovarian fimbria, attaches to the superior aspect of each ovary. 
proximal part of our fallopian tube, an important thing to remember is that they connect to the uterine cavity to the peritoneal cavity and the point where the fallopian tube opens into the uterine cavity is called the uterine opening of the oviduct or the fallopian tube. And as we can see, the proximal part of the opening forms the uterine tubal junction. The ovaries are a bilateral pair of flattened egg-shaped discs which themselves are egg-producing organs as well as endocrine organs, analogous to the testes in a man. In women, however, this structure is found in the pelvic cavity on either side of the uterus which we can see in this image. In order to understand the function of the ovaries, we have to look at the microscopic anatomy and it is important to note that the ovarian follicles are basic units of the ovaries. A follicle is a cyst-like sac in the ovary that embeds an oocyte, which is an immature ovum or egg cell. The oocyte mature in the follicles and once they have finished their maturation process, they become what we would now refer to as an ovum. And the ovum are released by the follicles in the fallopian tubes in order to be fertilized. The ovaries are released these egg cells every 3 to 4 weeks in the average adult female and are shed by the body in the process of menstruation. Let's now have a look at some structures that may be found in the ovaries. The first structure that we will look at is the tertiary follicle. And as I mentioned before, the follicles develop through different stages during the menstrual cycle. And when the follicle is fully matured, it's referred to as a tertiary follicle. It is also sometimes called as the graphene follicle, named after the first month to describe their development. And during the process of ovulation, usually only one follicle fully develops the other follicles degenerating in a process called atresia. Corpus luteum is the Latin term for yellow body, and as we could see on the previous slide, and when it wasn't highlighted, it is colored yellow. The main secretion of the corpus luteum is to develop and maintain the pregnancy by secreting the hormone progesterone. The corpus luteum forms a whitish scar, which is referred to as the corpus albicans. The corpus albicans, which is made up of collagen laid on by the fibroblast, persists as a scar on the ovary for several months before being absorbed. So now, Let's move on to look at some of the supporting structures of the uterus and the ovaries. And the first structure we will look at is the uterosacral ligament. This ligament arises from the body of the uterus and then attaches to the sacrum. And this ligament helps to hold the uterus in the place. The ovarian ligament is a fibrous ligament that connects the ovary to the lateral surface of the uterus. And we can see in this image how the medial aspect of the ovary is connecting to the uterine horn. And now, let us take a look at the suspensory ligament of the ovary. And as we can see, it extends out from the ovary to the wall of the pelvis. The suspensory ligament is a fold of peritoneum which some people consider to be part of another ligament, the broad ligament. The broad ligament connects the side of the uterus to the walls of the pelvis, as well as the floor of the pelvis. The broad ligament contains numerous structures such as ovaries, fallopian tube, and the ovarian vessels, and it is usually separated in three components, the mesometrium, the mesosalpanks, and the mesovarium. The mesometrium, which is essentially the mesentery of the broad ligament, makes up the majority of the broad ligament, and it extends from the body of the uterus to the ovarian ligament. The mesosalpings is the superior part of the broad ligament and is attached to the ovarian ligament medially, the fallopian tube superiorly and the suspensory ligament laterally. And the third 
and the smallest part of the probe ligament is the mesovarium. The mesovarium is actually is a transverse extension of the probe ligament. Inferior posteriorly suspending the ovary and it lies between the mesometrium and the mesosalpins and encloses the ovarian ligament. The ovarian artery is directly branched from the abdominal aorta across the respective ureters and then travel into the respective suspensory ligaments of the ovary before entering the mesovarium part of the broad ligament and it giving off branches to the ovaries. The ovarian arteries are the corresponding arteries to the testicular arteries in males. Both the ovarian veins drain the ovaries before traveling through the suspensory ligament. And the right ovarian vein then joins the inferior vena cava, while the left ovarian vein joins the left renal vein. Another structure that is found within the broad ligament is the ureter. And the ureter arises from the renal pelvis of the kidney before it descends retroperitoneally in the abdominal cavity. And in the pelvic cavity, it travels into the broad ligament before it enters the bladder. The epoophorin is a remnant of the mesonephric duct, which is an embryological structure that regresses in the females that differentiates into many reproductive organs in the male. Specifically, the epoophorin is the equivalent of the male epididymis, but does not really have a function in females, and the epoophorin is found bilaterally. The vesicular appendage of the epoophorin, which is a remnant of a mesonephric duct. Specifically, it's a remnant of the cranial part of the duct and the vesicular appendage is found bilaterally in a small pedunculated cyst that usually has no function. And we can see it in this image hanging down like a piece of fruit as it is pedunculated description describes. Now, let us proceed to the female external genitalia. The external genital organs consist of a vestibule, say the minora, clitoris, the bulb of the vestibule and its associated glands, and the labia majora, or the outer lips. Let us first discuss the vestibule. The vaginal vestibule is an area bordered by the labia minor, and within the vaginal vestibule, you will find the external urethral orifice coming from the urinary bladder and the vaginal orifice which leads into the vagina. You'll also find the lesser vestibular gland which helps to create a substance to lubricate the urethra opening. This substance is also believed to act as an antimicrobial as well. Now, there are mucus pair glands embedded in the perineal membrane called the greater vestibular glands or the baritolinch glands. These glands open into the posterior part of the vestibule they secrete fluid that helps the vagina. Sometimes the ducts of these glands can become obstructed and fluid backs up, forming a cyst called the Bartholin cyst. And that was the vestibule. Around the vestibule, there is the labia minora. Labia minora are two small kidneys for situated between labia majora. They extend from the clitoris oblique downward and the posterior ends of them are usually joined across the midline by the fold of the skin called the frenulum of the labia minora. The inner surface of the labia minora is lined by mucus containing numerous glands which moisten the vaginal vestibule. Next, we have the clitoris. This part, the clitoris is one of the most sensitive erogenous zones due to its high concentration of nerve endings. We say it's the female version of the penis since it is made up of corpus cavernicum, the same as the penis, and that is the erectile tissue. It consists of land clitoris, which is the terminal external part. The body of the clitoris is split into two crura of the clitoris, and around the land clitoris, we have the prefuse of the clitoris or the clitoral hood. This is a fold of skin that surrounds and protects the gland of the clitoris. Then we have this part, which is the bulb of the vestibule. 
This is a type of erector which is closely related to the clitoris. The vestibule bulbs are two bulbs of erectile tissue that start close to the inferior side of the body of the clitoris and then extend towards the urethra and vagina on the medial side of the clitoris cruise. It is formed by the plexus of penis blood vessels covered by the capsule. Here we see the lady minora and the glass clitoris. Lateral to the labia minora, we can find the labia majora. Each labium has two surfaces, an outer part which is basically skinny covered by hair and an inner part which is smooth with sebaceous glands. The labia are thicker upwards and at the upper angle where they meet, we call this area the anterior commissure. And posteriorly, they don't directly connect as the anterior side does, but together with the surrounding skin, they form the posterior labial commissure. In front of the pubis synthesis, we can find Mons pubis, located above the labia majora. It is triangular in shape, formed by fatty tissue and becomes covered by hair at the time of puberty. This is also where the raw ligament the uterus attaches to. And that was everything about the female genital organ. talk about the ovarian cycle and oogenesis. At the beginning of the ovarian cycle, menstruation occurs with small contractions known as menstrual cramps. The ovule and the thick and spongy layer on the uterine wall are discarded through the cervix to the vagina as menstrual bleeding. At around day 7, the proliferative phase occurs. There is an increased secretion of estrogen that travels to the brain and activates the pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone. On day 14, the luteinizing hormone begins to act on the ovaries, causing the dominant egg to mature rapidly and attach from the follicle. Now, one of the fallopian tubes surrounds the follicle, causing it to open completely and expel the egg. This is known as ovulation. At the end of the fallopian tube is the fimbria, a set of cells that are responsible for collecting the recently expelled egg and transporting it to the entrance of the fallopian tube. Once here, by means of muscular contractions, the ovum is pushed towards the center of the uterus. Starting on day 15, progesterone is produced inside the ovary, which is the hormone that helps the second phase of the menstrual cycle to occur. These days, the abundance of progesterone can make you feel more active and productive, and you will also notice an egg white like vaginal discharge being released. At the same time, you will also feel a greater desire to be with your partner. Towards the end of the cycle, the production of the progesterone decreases drastically, and that is when the so-called premenstrual syndrome occurs, which can cause various symptoms such as mood swings, inflammation, pimple, fluid retention, colic, pain and sensitivity in the chest among other emotional and physical symptoms. On day 28, the ovarian cycle is completed and will begin again from demonstration. Ovogenesis is the process in which a primary egg cell becomes mature ovium. There are a large number of follicles in the ovary. There is one primary oocyte in each follicle. Every month, one egg cell matures and is released into the fallopian tube to allow fertilization to occur. From birth to puberty, the number of primary oocytes reduces from 2 million to around 200,000 to 400,000. Only about 400 of these primary oocytes mature and get released from the ovaries. The oogonium undergoes mitosis and differentiates into primary oocytes. The primary oocytes are preserved in prophase 1 until puberty. Before ovulation, the primary oocyte undergoes meiosis 1 to produce a secondary oocyte and a polar body. The secondary oocyte undergoes meiosis 2 but stops in metaphase 2. During ovulation, the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary, while the mature follicle ruptures. 
The secondary oocyte will only proceed with meiosis II if fertilized by a sperm cell. The completion of meiosis II gives rise to an oocyte and a second polar body.